through some of the slides and show you some of the research that's associated with charcoal. So why charcoal has come to the forefront now is the discovery of some soil in the Amazon Basin. This soil is high carbon content, extremely fertile, even after thousands of years. So, if you look into charcoal itself, you ask, how is charcoal produced? It's normally by heating up organic, organic matter in the absence of restricted oxygen. So what we're doing there is we're restricting the oxygen in that, in that uh, stove. By doing that, we will leave the carbon residue. So some of the feedstocks for producing charcoal include forest residue from wood biomass, agriculture residue, like straw or rice husks or old husks, etc. Animal waste, dry animal waste, or municipal solid waste. They all can be carbonized. The solid form of charcoal then can be, it's got a high carbon content, so carbon is a form of, uh, is a <coughs> method of storing CO2, and that can be used for carbon sequestration. So this soil in the Amazon, when they started to sift through and find out how did it get so fertile, one of the major components they found is that it's charcoal rich. Also they found quite a lot of pottery shards, meaning that this soil is actually man-made, it wasn't a natural form soil, it was human intervention, very important. So when you look inside the char itself, one of the key characteristics is its surface area or its pore structure. Why that's so important? So when we go after, say, for, for example, selected beneficial bacteria, we can actually culture bacteria for particular functions, like, for example, due to be nitrogen fixing or phosphate solubilizing, very, very effective in the soil. So if you're able to get, if you're able to take biomass, just like we're doing there, turn it into clean energy, then take the carbon, utilize its characteristics for biological inoculation, or for nutrient enhancement or nutrient absorption, then it becomes a very functional commodity. Rather than burn it, for example, <coughs> then it's gone. So this is just some pictures of field trials that I did myself here a few years ago. Very evident. So what we did was just took a low quality charcoal. This was in this case was rice straw or rice husks. Very little uh, energy and a very little value and so to carbonize that, you can even carbonize it in the stoves like this. Then put it back in the soil, you can see these pots. What we know and uh, we didn't put any fertilizer on this. This is a key one of the key parts of research uh, our discoveries was early on uh, the benefits of the bacteria, the role the bacteria play. Even though we put no fertilizer here, you can see the growth far superior to the, the control. So where did we just come from? Then we start to look into the, the biological. We did some soil samples and did some isolations. And then bacteria with this the phosphate solubilizing, silica solubilizing, and nitrogen fix. This is another trial I did in Indonesia with the Biotrope Research Center, where we took tropical subsoil, so extremely poor soil, highly leached. We modified it with charcoal, so you can see the control, you can see charcoal, and then inoculated charcoal where we put in some beneficial bacteria. So you can see there the impact of growing seedlings. So if you look at reforestation projects, for example, to be able to take low quality soil, completely transform it to become more productive, more than twice as productive as a control. When you look at the potential for turning your, your local material into clean energy like this, no smoke. Carbon, and then have it change your soil to make it productive like this, that totally changes the economics of your, your soil productivity. So when we look at charcoal production, because there's such a renewed interest now in charcoal for, for its carbon sequestration and its function in agriculture, there's quite a lot of interest now in new methods to produce charcoal. Not this old killing nonsense where you've got smoke everywhere. That's a thing of the past. We now look at what's uh, termed as a third generation biomass stove. We're going to have to clean renewable energy with the intention of keeping the carbon. Why burn the carbon? I mean, you have to get all that in. So on larger scale, again, you'll find a lot of evidence of new carbonization methods like flash carbonization, high speed carbonization, high ground carbonization, flash pyrolysis, friction pyrolysis, and abated pyrolysis. I know a lot of these are quite expensive and, and in the early stage, but definitely looks like the thing of the future. 
the more we can get into utilizing charcoal effectively for carbon storage, soil amendment, etc. We really need to look at practical ways to produce the charcoal so it's cost effective. So the third generation stove, that's just one stove I took to, to Indonesia to demonstrate. When you look at the potential for stoves internationally, they're one of the few options we have, very practical, that can be implemented immediately to change the, climate, uh, the current climate status. What you may not know about inefficient combustion is it also releases a lot of black carbon or soot. Now that black carbon, when it falls back down, usually comes back down the glaciers, etc. It's, it's a proven fact that them black spots, when they land the glaciers, accelerate melt. So if we're able to provide clean energy, alleviate the sun, only use a fraction of the fuel previously used, I can benefit more than 2 billion people right now. That's a very logical, practical step of how we can all do something immediately for climate change. So for promotion of the stoves, I've obviously given presentations here before. My friend Christoph Steiner, he presented at the 2007 Bali conference. I presented myself at the climate change conference in Poznan. Quite a lot of interest now is, uh, and a few projects are, are getting some enabled, where stoves are actually being implemented with the intention of charcoal production. So international research, I talked about myself a few years ago, I've been at this for a couple of years now, a few years ago, I was inundated with people asking for charcoal samples. So I thought, why don't I get, why don't, because charcoal, if you make it at different temperatures, it has different characteristics. So I took it upon myself to actually go, make charcoal at selected temperatures, send them to 10 top universities that were given to me, and this was given to me by Dr. Christoph Steiner, send them at the research, or send them at the charcoal, have them do the research and give me the feedback, at least on what should we be making, what characteristics should the charcoal have so, so we get the biggest, the, the most out of it. I never got one bit of information back from any of these universities. It cost me thousands to send that, that material. Not one bit of information. So it came out a harsh lesson, but at least I learned, you got to do these things yourself. You can't wait for people to, to come and say, go after this, go after this, go after that. You've got to look at what you have, the feedstock you have, make it in a practical way, then find out what's the best way to use it. For example, mix it in compost or put it, mix it in with animal feed. So, I'm lucky enough to have some good friends who are similar minded. Uh, one, one such friend is uh, Ray O'Brady in Australia, and we send them out some charcoal and some, which you probably already are familiar with, is uh, bamboo vinegar, hardly acid. So one of the products Ray has there is that um, well, he'll take the charcoal, put in like this a selection of beneficial bacteria and fungi, and he sells that product as living soil. So it's got a broad spectrum of, of functioning bacteria. So again, we've, we've developed quite a lot of, these are all biological fertilizers. We, we presented this to a friend of mine from Uganda. There's some trials we can actually see first time. So seeding beds. So we just apply on this on this rule, we just apply the inoculated charcoal, in particular the nitrogen fixing, and then a, a mixed blend. But very evident the difference between the charcoal inoculated and controlled. So a major impact. This is a current rice paddy trial that we've got going here in Zhejiang uh, province. This has been done with the Zhejiang University, Agricultural University. And so in this trial, we did two different types of charcoal. Just straight charcoal, we didn't inoculate it, didn't do anything to it. What we found with the rice straw charcoal, we got 20% increase in yield in the first year, which is significant. If you take rice as the stable food in China, and we're able to carbonize the straw, the waste part, put it back into the soil, and get an immediate increase in yield. Significant. So the carbon stays at the source. So this year we'll expand this trial to one hectare, we've got uh, more funding to expand it. And, um, I hope in this year we'll be including the biological fertilizers. We've got an organic fertilizer, we've got a chemical fertilizer, and see what the, see what the outcome is. <coughs>